Good morning. 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 Good
now will not have a psychiatrist that will be able to write the prescription that they need to be able to get the care that they get. So underfunded is a big reason why we do not have the services that we need. Many struggle in spite without receiving the necessary support we need to manage their condition. And I heard someone earlier say the street. A lot of times they do that because they're, they feel embarrassed, they're shameful, they don't want people to know. It, it, it can really become a silent killer like other diseases in this world. What's been wrong with you? Yes, something has to be wrong with you. Um, not even realize that they have an illness, it's also an issue, and they continue to suffer despite the devastating effect on their lives. So I just want you to look at that picture for a moment. And I want you to think within yourself, what does that picture represent? Thank you, because it represents me. It represented all those times that I just wanted to silence the voices. I didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. I didn't want people looking at me and pointing at me like something was wrong. Oh, she's crazy. Mm -hmm. Something's not right with her. Do we know she's born from the floor and that they were in the room with us? We have to get to the point in our life where we don't care what they think. The only person we should be care about was somebody thinking God Almighty. That's right. Because he's all created. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. That is the biggest thing that will stop people from getting the treatment is because then they think, I shouldn't go get the treatment, and then they go and get treated, but they think, well, what are people going to think? So then you just kind of get stuck in the middle. That's not a good place to be. Not at all. Mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of. It is a medical problem, just like heart disease, diabetes, and other illnesses that die for. So many times, you hear this question, why not the patient or their families have been had a psychotic episode, a suicide attempt, or a mental disorder. Why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? And then they think, well, maybe it's because my mom had so and so, or my dad had so and so. Well, it states that it can be genetic. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, they have found that many disorders are caused by a combination of biological, environmental, psychological, and genetic factors. In fact, the growing body research has found that certain genes and gene variations are associated with mental disorders. So you may be asking yourself, what's classified as a disorder? There's a lot of disorders that's out there. I'm not going to read it because I believe everyone in this room is capable of reading them. But some of them may be familiar to you. You may know someone who suffered with depression or schizophrenia or ADD. There's also a book called The Diagnostic and the Physical Name. This is where a lot of the disorders are put. And believe it or not, they go through great effort to try to figure out what they need to put in there. You wonder, why do they need a code for mental disorders? You're going to find out later why these codes are important. That's just the door. Personality disorders, sleep weight disorders, there's a lot of different disorders out there. So again, what did I say? We are not alone. Because if we were alone, they couldn't have all these diagnoses put in a book with a whole lot of codes to determine what's going on with us. <laughs> if you get the new disorder will have to meet a host of criteria. The symptoms must be severe enough to cause impairment or distress. In the upcoming fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Name of Women's Disorders, they have diagnosis codes which have added suicidal behavior. And I always run with the same people Why this wasn't that book before? Why did it take them years and years and years to add that to this book? It is associated with one Now the thing is with that is a lot of times they just want to label us. So they'll say, oh, well, she was major, major, major depressive, or she was manic depressive. Well, everybody who's manic depressed or major depressive doesn't have to do commit suicide. Maybe they just felt hopeless. Maybe they just felt like they didn't have anybody to turn. Maybe they kept trying to turn to everybody, nobody could really make them, and they didn't need to Or they lost the Or a non suicidal stuff did Anyone know what a non suicidal stuff is? Could it be considered Exactly. Could it be considered 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 Could it be Telling you guys why it's important for this coach to be in there and said that it will help improve documentation of the behavior, which is served to estimate risk factors for future suicide in terms of death. And all these these folks will encourage research problems that are treated specifically rather than simply addressing these behaviors and symptoms of an associated condition such as major depressive disorder. Now, when you all walked in, most of you all, I gave a piece of paper and a pen. Mm -hmm. 
I do want this to be an interactive session, so when I get to more into these guys, I'm going to start asking some questions. Get everybody to get to talk about it. We don't want to talk, but guess what? We're going to talk about this today. That's my desire. So I pray to God that I want to do something that was going to help people. This isn't about me. This is about what God wants to do. But we're to write down these questions that you know about. How many of you all are familiar with the 988 number? This number even exists. Situation, you're going to have to remember a long 1-800 number. one 800 If I'm having a crisis, that's too many numbers. I need a number that I can get to somebody quickly can answer some questions, give me some report, and give me some Jesus something that's going to help me to make it through the day. I don't need to remember something long. So you all remember this number for yourself, for your loved ones, or for your coworkers, or anybody that you feel like they may be going through a crisis situation at some point in your life. But then the old age question comes up. Do mental illness exist back in the Bible days? Has mental illness been around forever? Mm. It's been around for a long time. And for you all who probably were in Sunday school a couple of Sundays ago, they talked about this exact topic about a man that was being possessed named Leach who had like 6,000 demons in him. He had an unclean spirit. That's not my word. That wasn't the word he said in the Bible. He had been bound with chains and with fetters, but nothing could hold him because he was so disturbed. And a lot of times we're disturbed. He would sit around all night and day in the mountains, in the tombs, lying and cutting to himself. What do you think would drive someone to be in so much distress and so much pain that they will cut themselves every single day? Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> because Jesus showed his name compassion and he came unto him in faith and it said, for he said unto him, Come out of this man, thou unclean spirit. You think we don't still need Jesus today? Absolutely. Absolutely we need Jesus. There is some hope. So as First Lady Denise Mackin, thank you so much for having me today. She asked me to step in, and I graciously did that for her because I'm very passionate about mental illness and being able to train and teach others. But there's also some people that are here that are interested, which is Robert White and Linda White, who actually have so if you need some help, there are the people to go to see. Now what I really like about this back here up there is it says cash your cares on God, but he cares for you. So I like the fact that they named the kid. And then it says counseling and relief every day. We don't need some counseling and relief every day. I think we all do. This is their information. Please take it down, get your phone, you can come over here and do this. Where you have you can increase it. Because I understand that they are doing big things for our community. And they are here local. So you don't have to drive 45 minutes to go see them if you need the help. Robert White has a master's in art. He also has a license in chemical dependency counseling, license in um, professional counseling. And then White has a master's in science and some of the things that her husband has. They're located on Harrison Avenue. They also have a YouTube channel. I actually took time to look at some of their YouTube videos because I want to learn a little bit about who are these people that I'm represented today. It's good to know who you represent and who you are. So if I was going to go and get care from someone, I want to know what do they specialize in. We have our primary care physicians, and typically they take care of our general health, our general concerns. But if you have some chronic disease, maybe some arthritis, or some fat, or some issues, you're probably going to go see an orthopedic doctor, right? And if you're going to have surgery, you're going to have an orthopedic surgeon do it. If you have asthma or allergies or anything like that, respiratory, you could have gone to a respiratory and you medicine doctor. Well, it's the same with your mental health. You need to go to someone who can treat you for the things that you're dealing with. So it's such that they are specialized in marriage and couples counseling, family counseling, you can read the rest. I was very excited to know that they 
um, offer sexual abuse trauma therapy because I actually run a nonprofit ministry to support sexual assault patients. So it's good to know that there's someone in the area that when I cannot, because I can't counsel them, I'm not a therapist, I can support them, but I can refer them to someone that can help them with the things that they have that's going on in their life at that time. So I said this is going to be in the back. I want to know what you're struggling with. Let's have a conversation. Now, we just talked about embarrassing. We talked about shame. And by the way, nobody is forced to say anything. But there is something that you want to lay it all down right now and get it out. I want you to have the opportunity to do that. Tell us about your experience with mental illness or a family member, something that you may be concerned about. Tell me why you were excited to come here this morning to hear me speak a person who you know. Vision, he has glaucoma and his vision is slowly deteriorating. And I get depressed because I can't do everything for me and him, but I struggle with the fact that I want to take care of him and I'm not taking care of myself. Self care is so important. You have to get to a place it's just so hard. It is hard. It's important, but it's very hard. It is extremely hard. And so hopefully by the end of the session that I came to talk a little bit more yeah. about it. So thank you for that. Why don't any questions that uh, that you may have? Because we're gonna go back, I'm gonna finish this, and then we'll go back and we'll talk a little bit more. And I'll be praying for you just a little bit. Thank you. Because um, it's so it's so it's so difficult. Yes, of course. Um, my brother passed away and he, he had a big problem with the medication. He was making a game while he was talking. And one of them came to the other. They had a shot now that somebody had to have schizophrenia. It was about six months. And I'm so excited about that. I was going like, and then a lot of the people that are out on the street that are homeless, a lot of them are to have no other but I'm excited as a uh, doctor's lesson. Very much so. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone on this side? Yes, sir. I want to just, uh, from a man's perspective, I think it's, it's, it makes me feel less than a man to, to, to share something like that with some other uh, people. I just had uh, an episode as well. It really hit me, and I lost a lot of weight. Everything was a problem. Everything was on me. I isolated myself from my family. I isolated myself from work. And it was hard to deal with it. You would, you would sometimes you would think you would, you would wonder why people, and if you know it's wrong, you would say, man, I would never commit suicide. But you know, you wonder why people can think that way. Because thoughts like that that are going to cross your mind. Yes. And from a bad perspective, it's embarrassing to go and get help from other people. I just started seeing a psychiatrist. I thought that was very embarrassing. But come to find out, my boss's boss struggles with it. And other people at work that I'm able to talk to that kind of helps me kind of get through it. But yeah, it can be embarrassing, but now I'm not embarrassed about it. Yeah. I mean, it's a competition. You never know. I mean, I'm a worrier when I was told. And I can worry myself into a home. But yeah, but the, just saying for them, for men, I felt embarrassed to tell anybody or go get help or share. And it, it, it can affect your, your your blood pressure. It can affect your heart rate. If my blood pressure stayed up, 
between 173 and 180 over over 116 and heart rate 130. Yeah, you know, and it did, and that makes you pace and pace and pace, and you want to stop your heartbeat beat to your ears so much 24 seven, and that's how people think. <coughs> and what do you think about how you want to be? And that's a, that's a very important part point that he brought up because you know so many times men and, and not just our black community but in all communities they'll tell men as little boys man up don't be no crybaby don't be no sissy get up and, and do what you need to do and so that they go into these men who don't know how to feel their emotions and they don't feel like they can go and share their weaknesses with anyone because somebody's going to get me crazy I'm not being a man I'm less than a man if I have to go and seek this care and I've been told not to do that and so we need to as a community of people stop raising these young boys and y'all can give me for this afterwards y'all might not have me back but i have to be honest with you yes, you know me too, too. Me too. Me too. Me too. i'm setting them up to fail mm -hmm. i did not get the necessary help that they need and so i'm glad that you took the effort to say okay regardless of what anybody else says i'm at a point in my life now to where i know that i need to get this help and so and it was my doctor, instead of me doing what my doctor told me to do, he needs to go see a psychiatrist. Now in my head, he's going to put this thing on me, stick needles all in my brain. And all. <laughs> but when you're in that state of mind, every little thing is a big problem. I lost weight, it was a big problem. I cut myself and put the rocks out on it, and I saw it bubbles, now I've got infection blood. Everything was a problem. He didn't put himself on her. He put him on accident. Right. I mean, everything becomes a problem. You know, you start to notice stuff on your body that you've probably been there. But now you're just noticing it. Now, now I'm just not. I, I went to the hospital without even letting her know that I had already went through my job and everything in her name, packed all my stuff from work, and I was going on vacation. So I'm not coming back. And that's the first time I ever brought a bottle to the emergency room with me. And I was prepared to, for them to tell me, Mr. Cooper, I'm sorry, help you. And I was scared, but I was prepared. I didn't tell nobody what I was doing. I would just tell anybody I love them. I was all about my way and, and, and getting ready for the worst move that I can think of. And this was before I finally thought that. I'm, I'm definitely glad that you are sneaking to me that you're not going to hear the psychiatrist and hopefully you keep your regular appointment. Oh, my God. Uh, that's that, also very important. That medicine has been, I mean, some medicine do work. Now I have my appetite back. I gained 40 more pounds. <laughs> 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 it's just been helped because it, it balances me. <laughs> yeah. If I feel that for so, it'll catch it. I would not dare have you all share your story and not share mine. So let me tell you what Lady Mac doesn't do is that I myself and my family have a couple of mental illness. So when she called and asked me to do this, I'm sure she didn't know my story. I see your hand up. Go ahead, Lady You know, I don't I don't get people's story, but it brings me I'm a person, people and people, whatever. In this pandemic and I'm not working and I have a walker. I'm in the house a lot. And I, I want to thank my pastor, Mrs. Cherry, but I want to thank Mr. Lewis. She said right there. Raise yes, your hand. Right here. Oh, right here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, because of her, what, I, what I'm doing now, I, I, my house is always full of people grandmothers, grandfathers, and children. And we had a two bedroom house, and we had 10 people living in it. And we were always together. Right. So I'm glad I'm back at church. But yeah. Sister Lewis was sending cards to everybody. Oh, and God. because yeah. of her, mm -hmm. I spent half of my little check buying cards oh, to so send to the sick, shut in, mm -hmm. to read, whatever. Mm -hmm. And because I do that, that helps me with the stroke of being mm -hmm. by myself a lot. Because my husband's 83, he's back at work. Mm -hmm. But I'm not. I'm 81 and I'm still at home. So I send cards and people who know that I send cards, they use even her send me a book of stamps and a card. Oh, wow. And when my sister died, I had four people who sent me four books of stamps, which was pretty funny. I sent all those stamps out. I did eight cards. Woo! So but that's my struggle at first because I had nothing to do correct. Because after we 
sold our house after the party, so we used to move into an apartment. Well, how many days does it take to clean two bedrooms? <laughs> right? <laughs> I can't disagree with that one. <laughs> it don't take all day long to do it. Yeah. So that's, that was my struggle. But now I can sit down and write a card, and most of the cards in time are empty, and I put it up in the middle. So that has helped a lot. A great example of community coming together. Yes. We are yes. each other's community, by the way, yes. to yes. say, hey, there's a social Lisa. That's what we can go do to go and help her. And so, by Sister Betsy, and if I get y'all's name wrong, please get on and bet you look one. You know, she saw that there was a need for people, and she said, well, let's see what I can do. And it may seem like it's something so small. But you never know how that something small can really touch, really touch somebody's heart yeah, and help them get through their life. It helps me because I'm lost at that moment. You got to be working out there all by myself. So I have to do it. That, that's really it. We're going to continue. So I told you I would tell you all my experience with community I'm going to start with some of my family members. And I won't call any names because I didn't get approval from them to share their story. So you would just see situations and not name or how they related to me. But each person I'm talking about, there was a close relationship with me. Um, two of them overdosed on the hill. Uh, only by God's grace did they not die from the overdose. They did it with the people that they needed. I sat and watched someone commit both of their wrists with a straight razor. We get the army with love swearing out. Uh, thank God they did not from those injuries, but the pain was just so deep that they didn't want to live any longer. Um, someone who was shot in the head, they claimed that he committed suicide. Our family did not believe that that was the case because he seemed very happy. But I will caution you on that. Sometimes, even the people who seem to be their happiest, they are dying inside. There's this poem called, Please Hear What I'm Not Saying by Charles Dean. And if you ever get a chance to read that poem, because it really, really hits basis on how far away you can get, get and who that person really is. Uh, Bob Holden, I was afraid that I had a child. This was my difficult situation, so I could relate. And she said she wanted me to help her husband. She didn't have any time for herself. She needed to come self care. But my daughter had a sense deficit disorder. It's the same child, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, oppositional deficit disorder, and now as an adult, she has transmitted and disorder. I spent my life caring for my child because I couldn't just leave her out there for anyone. But in the midst of that, I was tired. I had a lot of sleepless nights. I wasn't eating right. I was doing absolutely nothing to take care of me because I spent all that time taking care of the child. And it wreaked havoc on my family because I had two other children. So they both as adults and they said, oh, she was your favorite. You were always there for her. You wasn't there for me. And you know, that would hurt me because it's like I did the best that I could with what I had been given. And so then that caused me to start having some mental anxiety and depression and things because I felt like I wasn't the one. I was trying to do the best that I could with what I had been given. Schizophrenia, I had a, um, Another family member who came to our house when I was young, I was in high school. And um, it was like 2 a.m. in the morning. She had brought her, and I'm trying not to cry. She had brought her son to the house with her, who was about 10 at the time. And she had this night that she's banging on the door, banging on the door. And so you know, someone went to go and open the door. When she came in, she said, my child is, is the devil. He, he's, he's a beast. And so he had a little small apple, but she started parting the hair. And she's telling us, Look, he has 666 in his head, and we're looking, we're looking. We didn't, we didn't see what she was talking about because she was physically, she was living in and out of the outlet. And so this went on from 2 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning to where then she was going to kill all of us with the knife because we didn't believe her. Now we're all the devil because the devil has infiltrated our house, and you don't see it's the devil. It was just, it was traumatic. It was a mess. 9 o'clock in the morning, we were finally able to get authority and some number of people to come to the house to basically take her to have some inpatient um, treatment. She did recover. I'm grateful that she recovered. Her son, however, did not, because he never could understand why a mother that was supposed to love him so much would all of a sudden not say that. He was a devil. Um, mental illness is real. It is not something to take lightly. It is not something to play with. I myself suffered with post-traumatic stress disorder and disassociative identity disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder 
they mainly focus on sexual assault by encounter as a child. Most of the time, PTSD has been associated with our military forces. I have great respect for our military forces. And I couldn't even imagine going through the things that they have to see when they're seeing people getting their limbs shot off, people that don't recover, people that's constantly dying sometimes at the hands of them because they're trying to go against the enemy. But also we have other people like myself that had extreme triggers and sometimes even to this day because of the sexual abuse that happened to me as a kid and then as an adult and nightmares and a lot of the other things. The dissociative identity disorder for you all that don't know, that's what they used to call back in the day multiple personality disorder. I had seven of them. There was a child protective mechanism for me. For me. That's what I learned through my psychology. That because I had experienced such pain and such trauma in my life that I created these other people to try to save me based on myself. So on the flip side of that, I didn't end up cutting myself or doing self injury to myself because I allowed these other people to take on all this pain and anxiety and things that I was dealing with. Is that a good thing? Absolutely not. It took years for me to come back and say, I'm just patty. I'm not patty and this and this. And that. I'm just, I'm just patty. I suffer through anxiety and depression from bad marriages, bad work. This is my fourth marriage. I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm so grateful that God bless me with a man with some sense. Thank you, Jesus. I'm very thankful. I didn't nobody else to add. No more questions. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank Anxiety medication. That was a time that I couldn't hold a glass of water because my hands were shaking so bad. I would have to hold it like this. Nothing to touch on Now, during the time all these things were happening, I couldn't tell you that I didn't experience any shame and distrust. And I didn't know who was really going to be bothered to me, who was really going to take care of me. But I was so glad that I got the help that I needed. In our generation, being professional counseling was founded on the session from the time that I was growing up. Our forefathers were seeing on saying, whatever goes over this house, face in this house. And I do believe that there are some things that should stay in the house. Yeah. If your baby is getting sexually assaulted in that house, you need to say something. You need to believe them. If there's something going on in your house that's not right, I'm not talking about little gossip. Okay. No, you don't need to be over there telling your mommy feet. But if there's something that's going on, let God do with that. Mm-hmm. If there's something that's going on where that child is being harmed or someone is being harmed at the hands of another person, that's something, in my opinion, that you should share. Mm-hmm. If you go back into your ancestors, ancestors, you will probably feel that you take the only hope in this that you need her and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now let me tell you something. Prayer has got me a long way. <laughs> And I do not denounce prayer under any circumstances. I have one of the greatest prayer words, and I say that because I know that's what God made me be. I enjoy praying for us. I enjoy my people being healed and home. Yeah. I love that. Jesus, help me to get through all this stuff that I'm talking to you all about right now. But I also very much believe in our medical profession. I believe that God is such a great creator that he gave some people, all people, but you have to know that gift is. The ability and the mind and to study the science so that they can come out and help us for the things that we need in life. So, yes, I believe in prayer. Yes, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in mental health care. Yeah. I believe that it's okay to go and seek additional help. I will say, if you make a decision to do that, try them out. You're going to try our church before you do it. Mm-hmm. Let me go and you say, oh, I don't want to go to that church. They don't have the right kind of music. <laughs> no, this church, oh, it's, it's not the right coach in this church. I don't like this church. You know, so why not do the same thing as trying to take care of yourself? <coughs> you should be just as important about making sure that you're connected with a person that's going to connect with you. I want to see three psychologists. I would be the person to you give me no good. They give me more harm than they could ever do me good. One, because they didn't believe my story. So why am I going to spend time with someone who doesn't even believe what I'm telling you? But at the end, I had a friend of mine who referred me to a psychologist who was a great help to me. He didn't allow Patty to just get away with me. In fact, when I first started going to him, he said, now, nah, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be tough. I'm not going to go easy on you. And I went into his office one time, I'm thinking I'm so slick because I don't need to share the thing I don't want to share. I don't want to be one of them for the first thing they don't know nothing about me. He asked me a question. I just simply told him, well, 
And he looked and he said, now you know, that's the craziest thing anybody ever said. And you know what? He was like, because it was something I had to do because I didn't want him to know all of the stuff that I was doing at that time. But that was the start of a great journey for us. He had all the good knowledge that he needed to have. Every psychological book to tell you about your emotion, about your mind, and the rest. But one thing he also had is he was a retired pastor. So he was able to help me mentally, physically, spiritually. I had to have that spiritual life. There's no one who could have helped me without telling you about how Jesus saved me. There's no one who could have helped me without telling you about how I could get over because those people that were in the Bible days, they got over. Hebrews 12 is one of my greatest chapters. It says, by faith, this person did that, this person did this. I'm like, yes, he can do it by faith. So I'm here to tell y'all today, there's hope for you all, for everybody in this room. There's no nothing doing this, or nothing distressing that you can go through that you can't get the help because now we've given you all the things to do. You have Jesus, that's number one. And then you have our sister and brother, right? He's more than willing to, I'm sure, counsel. Give you psychology and help. And if it's not a good fit, what did I say? Go out and find someone else. We are not alone. So, how can you help someone with mental illness? I love this book. This came from healthguide.org. It's called the LEAP method. So, it's to listen, empathize, agree, and talk. So, you want to listen without commenting, disagreeing, or arguing. I went to a family member of mine one time when I was really dealing with some mental crisis issues, and I said, I'm so depressed. And the person looked at me and they said, well, girl, you're the happiest person that I know. <laughs> what they didn't know is I was contemplating suicide. And I absolutely was not home. Now, what I will say is that some of that I bought on myself, because for years I hid behind a mask of shame and hurt, but I also hid behind a mask of happiness and fun because I didn't want anybody to know about my greatest secret that I was hurting and I was in pain. So when a person couldn't believe me, they didn't believe me because I never showed them who I really was. Show people who you are so you can get the help that you need. Think about Try putting yourself in their shoes. That would be one of the hardest things in the world. I give you a great example. There's cancer that is going rapid in and out of my family. Cancer that's going rapid in and out of my family. And so I told my children that if I ever got cancer, I wouldn't do chemo on radiation. My mom didn't do it. I have no reason. I personally don't feel like it works. So if I don't feel like something works, I don't do it. Now, if and ever that happens to me, God may completely change my mindset to where I may very well be able to do that. But my kids said, well, that's just selfish. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to hear my point of view as to why I didn't want to do it. All they could think about is, if you don't do it, then you're going to die. Well, God is the only person who has an appointed time to death for me. So that doesn't mean that because I choose not to do something that it's going to kill me. But God also gives us the wisdom to know what we need to do. So if that time would come and I need to do it, I would know, but try your hardest to empathize with others. Agree, become a neutral observer, and find some common ground. We talked some about medication. So a person who is having a mental crisis may not want to take that medication anymore. Especially if they're hearing voices that tell them you don't need to take that medication. That medication is going to keep you. That medication is going to do something to you. Well, instead of saying, don't take that medicine, don't. Just sit there and say, well, let me ask you something. How did you feel when you were taking the medication? And they'll say, oh, I feel, I feel free. I was able to work. I didn't have random thoughts. I was able to concentrate more. I, I, you know, they'll tell you all these great things. OK, well, then show them to me. How did you feel about the medication? Oh, I couldn't breathe. And I didn't have any concentration. And I was angry all the time. That would be a great start for saying, well, how about we try to do this? Let's see if you can help somebody. But well, what you don't want to do is when that person says, I'm not taking that medication, so you don't have to take that medication. Well, you better take that medication. If you don't take that medication, you're just going to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do that crazy. Come on. For real? No. And partner, love respect, and do your best to be non judgmental. It's hard. It's hard to not look at other people. Mm -hmm. Even me. Like I said, y'all are lonely. So you all can look at me all day, but guess what? 
Okay. <laughs> I don't care because I'm healed from that part of my journey. But that was a time that I would have cared. I went to work one day, I had one piece of hair sticking up. And this lady came and she said, Oh my gosh, you just irritate me. Because you walk in here at work and you got that hair sticking up. You brushed out in the chair. That's how I'm not how I was. During the time that I was raising my children, one of the things that I did talk about was what's called PPA, pseudodubular <laughs> disorder. And it's a disorder to where you have these emotions that you don't have control over. So we could be all playing around the house, jacks, whatever, you know, talking about old school a long time ago. And I'm laughing, and I'm having a good time with my kids, and all of a sudden, a huge amount of depression would fall on me. And I would go from laughing, from a very happy moment, by the way, to crying. I don't mean just cheers for them. I mean full-fledged crying, full-born, scaring my kids to death. I didn't know that until they were grown, during their 30s and 40s now. That particular diagnosis, it's not up there now, I had on the previous screen, was not a big factor in the time that I was going through speech different anxiety. It is today, people being diagnosed with it. So my daughter called me on the phone one day, my oldest daughter being funny, of course, and she said, Mama, we always do something with you. <laughs> so when I told her I was going to come and talk about my mother, they said, oh, they got the right person. I said, I'm not sure if I like the way she's doing right now. But that's how I was going to do it. I by by houses, by houses, counsel, officers, by those holding licenses, state, respectively, to these type of professional counselors. I can't hire other officers for it. I would need your medical professional assessment and your recommendation to report to the policy future lifelong practice. Time for questions. I gave you all some sheets when I came in because I said to hold your questions to the end. You did have some interactive moments, but if you all have any questions for me, I would be happy to do my best to answer them. If I don't, I will refer them to Lady B. Mac or Thank you. 
what you know, you would think you won't fare to work right away. And, and I'm not going to say it did, but in my mind, I felt that all right, right, I still feel the same way. You know, but you know, she said you just got to believe in God. And it took a long time for me to process that, even though I was grew up in a whole district. It took me a long time to process that until, and then she also said, maybe you need to be in I was trying to, I was looking online doing home remedy to kill myself, <laughs> like, you know, to bring my blood pressure down and stuff. But, you know, from, from thinking about that, finally getting, finally getting the help, finally noticing what the issue was, it could have been a, a way that I was trying to get my attention. But man, soon as I got to a point to where I was, in, that I was saying, because they kept me out of church, too. They kept me away from church. And I joined the man's choir, man's ministry, going to Bible study, whatever you think of. So, but it, it does, I mean, people say, like you said, God put people in places to give you help. Medicine, doctors, I mean, so you just have to take that step in that hand. And I had an awesome support system between my wife and my mom. And you know, so many times, uh, and I know this is for me, for a lot of times I'm talking about me, but you're supposed to go help someone else. But for me, I think that during the time that I was praying, the reason that it wasn't working is because I was so distracted with so many other things that was going on. My husband will tell you right now. He'll be talking to me about something. I'm going to ask him a question. You know, Bruce, where are you going in five minutes? He may have answered me, and I'm already in the next week about it. all the things I need to do and where I need to go. And then he'll come back, and I'll say, babe, you didn't tell me you were going to I did. <laughs> I did. So for me, prayer was not as effective as it should be because I couldn't silence all the distractions that was going on. And I can remember even up speaking one time. The church. I had all these distracted <coughs> thoughts where I couldn't even focus on the message that I was supposed to be reading before God's people. <gasps> and then all of a sudden I see all this is a gift from God. All these cards, like all around me, like none of them hit me, but they were just <coughs> everywhere, everywhere. And, and I'm, I'm looking at me because I'm trying to keep me honest, like, okay, she's going to have a moment. Cars going all around, and all of a sudden I heard the still voice of God say, You feel no longer. That is what helped me to silence all the distractions that was going on. So now I, I felt like it was strong. Because before, I would start praying. And when I tell you the enemy would put every thought in my head, there would be all kind of thoughts. So I could even focus on the prayer. Thank God that he says, even when we're grown, we don't know what to pray. God is there praying and interceding for us in our behalf. Because I know that he had to be praying for me. Because I couldn't do it. I didn't even have the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to be able to go out there and pray. And so, but I still say you need to try. If you don't try to increase your life, you don't try to be better. If you don't go out there and get the help that you need to be better, guess what? You won't get there. That's just going to happen through osmosis. In most cases, it's not. So very good. Thank you. For your yes, You would look at her body and think, all is well. I mean, she's working, she's taking care of herself. I mean, she's already in the whole nine yards. But she's a thinker. And I don't think she ever stops thinking. Yeah. And she looks at her life, she has things that she wants, things and goes where she wants it. But I think, she told me, she said, although I'm here, and she, she doesn't live without you, she lives in another city. She said, by herself. She's she's happy but she's lonely at all at the same time because she doesn't have um, what I would call a support system. And one day she told me, I'm gonna go to the a psychologist. And I started that thing, what are you doing that for? Blah, 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 blah. And then it took me a little bit to, to realize that was not where I need to go. But if she needed help with something, that's what she needed to eat. As a parent, I wasn't there to help her, and I don't have the expertise to help her. Right. But but I think she's a she's one of those people, and sometimes people are like that, where if if your life is not as you pictured it, although it's good, you're still not you, you, you feel like you you are less than what you need to do. And I think for me as a parent, I'm like I cannot help her, but I. I I'm 
learning. I haven't learned, but I'm learning to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, <laughs> <learning. laughs> I, I saw some of those things. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to do that one. I'm trying to do that one because I would always try to give a suggestion or um, try to try to help, but I I can't because I don't have. To. So sometimes just listening and not I'm saying anything help. is a help. That is one hundred percent. Thank you for sharing because we need to be in a position where we can listen more, so we can understand more. Go ahead. How do you get someone to see care that don't think they have? How do you get someone to see care that don't know they have a problem? Without the without the. I'll give you a situation and say, "Well, I have a problem." And you come and say, "Well, have you just had an accident?" What do you do? I'm going to keep coming back and saying, what do you do? Well, I'll just know that there's been some changes and there may not be a healthy gift. So, why don't you just come with me? Because I think there's a need for you to someone to be talking. You don't want to say, you're not right. You don't want to be, you know, I'll just, you know, gentle boy. Right, we can ask that kind of behavior. Yeah. 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 Here she comes again. You know, is she trying to tell me she needs to go get help for herself? You know, I mean, you know, people are not people. Are yeah. Good. And, and so, so you know, you just continue to use that nice, quiet, gentle voice and go stay listening. Because at some point, you're going to catch them at a moment where you go, I'm I'm going to that. And then, because prayer and God can do a whole lot more than we are at than what we are at. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Questions? Or leave anybody out? I want to say one thing that happened was my baby sister oh. <laughs> invited me over to spend the day with her and her family. What was that day for? Easter. Oh, now see, I forgot what day it was. But when, when you when you do that, invite somebody come uh, anxiety. If this is a the pandemic did bring along a lot of other people got anxiety. I've had anxiety off and on ever since I was probably about 15, 16 years old. Off and on. It might come and I say something, and um, what the doctor told me, probably about 10 years ago, I had to take something for anxiety for the rest of my life. But when I was growing up and when my young ass up, it was just kind of periodically. But um, it really helped when somebody. I was telling her, my baby sister, I have had such a good, I have felt so good since I spent the day with her and her family. Her husband talked about God. And he told me some new things. I'm 65 years old. <laughs> he educated me. Yes, yes. And so when you get together and you talk about God, it's a spiritual spirit. Yeah. And so um, I just wanted to kind of suggest that, uh, that if you could. That really, really helps me. And, you know, you brought up a good point because really, you know, so much of the social media age already had people staying at home and just sit behind the computer and yes, get on Twitter true. and Instagram and Snapchat and everybody mm -hmm. else. And then you had the pandemic on top of this, and now you got people mm -hmm. working from home. They used to be able to get out of their house and go to their job and go, no, so they're just right now at an all time high yeah. because people are not connecting. Mm -hmm. They're not taking out that time to invite people over. It's like, when's the last time you invited someone over for fun and dinner? Oh, you come over, you better have a mask on. I'm going to eat. <laughs> 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 I saw the sign 
said, no, man. Be quiet. I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to get it had its place at the time that we were talking, but it was like, okay, y'all, we kind of just get back to some normal here, yeah. yeah, but we don't have to be so afraid of everything. We don't have to be How do you or the others handle generational curses? Once you finally identify what those generational curses are, then I talked about a lot from the pulpit. It is mentioned in the Bible in a couple of places, but when you see things in your family, it's kind of like, oh, my mother had that, my grandmother had that, my sister has that. You know, how do I, you know, prayer? But how do? You, and this may be a whole different subject. <laughs> Generational curses. How do you how do you handle those? How do you dissect them? How do you start attacking? Them? Generational curses connect right? Oh, I thought about it. Right, I, you know, that's a very good question. We talked about genetics, and chances are genetics kind of go right and hand in hand with generational curses. That's right. In my opinion. Again, I'm, I'm oh, not yes. a scholar. I'm, uh, <laughs> it, it goes together, and so I would say that that person will need to seek help. And sometimes, since we are older, it's more than one person. We are wiser, we are more mature, we have a lot of age, you mature at different stages of your life. It may be time for you to get with your family and have that part of time. Oh, yeah. Quit hiding the fact that that your grandmama had cancer. Quit hiding that great grandmama had leukemia with them. Our own family don't even know what's going on. And then that person died, and that person died. Now we're getting older, and nobody knows anything about anything. Chances are there's somebody somewhere along in your life in that family that has something that was going on. Get with your family and talk about it. Work, work through with your family. That would be my suggestion. And then make sure they have a relationship with God. And if they're not church, it is the church. So they can learn about generational curses, so they can learn about how they can defeat these diseases and, and be able to live a healthy life. But because staying there and doing nothing, old folks used to say, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. And I certainly did agree, right? If you keep doing the same thing, you get the same results. That's right. You have to get to a point in your life where you do some different things, you can get some different results, and hopefully more healthy, productive results. I was on. Thank you all so much. I hope you all got something out of it. Maybe you learned something today, whether it was statistics or how to just have that open conversation and communication. Continue to talk. Don't leave this room and say, oh, that was good, but now I'm good. No. <laughs> we just sit here for an hour with you all. I'm sorry, Lady Mac, I didn't have the time uh, for how well, long we've been here and not do something with the information that you've gained. Take some time for yourself. There has to be someone that can sit with your husband from time to time so that you can just go enjoy a movie, go get your nails, and you have to take some time for yourself because if not, you are going to burn out and then you are not going to be good for you are yeah. right here. Just, I'm prepared to tell you, tell you that from my heart because I've been there. Yes, yes. May, I ask, uh, may I ask that since your husband uh, brought that up, uh, could he? Uh, say a prayer of breaking generational curses. Okay, one, two, three, four, breaking generational curses. William DeFong. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all the ones that participated in this conference, and Father. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do, and Father. Please go with our families that have generational curses. <laughs> Help them to be identified. Help them to be talked about. <laughs> Help them to be talked through. Help them to be resolved, Heavenly Father. Because it's got to stop. <laughs> We have to learn from our history, whether it's a medical issue or a psychological issue or a physiological issue or a family issue. And rather, we have to learn to get rid of those demons. And rather, thank you for Sister Patty. Thank you for Sister Mac. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. <sighs> references that I need for the presentation. Um, this is a presentation I created myself. Anyone who wants it, feel free to connect with me or with Lady Mac. I'll send it to you guys. It's not like something I'm holding on to. Oh, that's my presentation. I want people to be helped. Um,
I want them to be whole and I want them to be set free. So if there's something in there that can help you to get there, I want you to have it. I want to support you with the knowledge and the skills and everything that you need to be able to move to the next level in your life. Not just for me, but for everyone. I will close us out in prayer. I'll have Lady Matt come up and close us out in prayer. Is there anyone else that I don't want to? Anybody for me to say, well, she didn't give me an opportunity to talk. Y'all can do that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> Oh, she told me somebody cursed out. Now, this is in kindergarten. And I said, We're going to go to the classroom. I want to see who. I said, The teacher didn't say anything. I, was, uh, I thought she wasn't telling the truth, really. So, we're going down the hall, and I'm dragging her because I think she's making this up. Okay, and then she stopped. And she said, There wasn't anybody. It was Oh. And I said, oh, well, it was good that day to say LCC was in my room that day. And that's the one. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And so I said, could she be telling the truth? She said, oh, yes, yes, she can. And I was like, oh, well, you know, she said it more before, and the teachers are scared of her because they think she's. But at that moment, we called Tamara and we uh, had a couple of conversations. And I only think about that. She said, Keep the treatment up. People said she could grow out of, you know, not hearing all those different voices. And she could tell you who they were, and, you know, they had names and stuff like that. and, and Stuff like that, but again, I was saying, Don't take it like that. I thought, I thought she was making up something just not be in trouble or to get out of you know, yeah, or something like that. And then, um, it doesn't, it, it was a couple of, of uh, some of our kids, um, I think the doors were open, and I think a parent was out there, you know, just job racing and doing too much, but it is up to kids, so they had. Anxiety as well. So, you know, it was my room. You know, about an hour or so before we could actually go back to class. And, uh, you all be sure that when you leave this room, see what's happening in the And I say that because I, people are also crippled by someone going out and saying, Ooh, I was in the stand the other day at Sister Patty. I can't tell you how crazy that woman is. She got so many issues. All that's going to do is hurt you at some point. You don't have anything positive to say about this woman. You just don't like her. You know, yeah. Yeah. We did not want to be Because we're not here to drag people down. We're here to lift up people from the air. There's no time to drag Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well. Mr. Um, Reverend White and Sister White gave me some of that card and some of that flight, but it's not a lot of them. So, um, we'll have another um, class or session uh, sometime soon, but I, I'll, you'll, you'll hear about it. You'll hear about it. So, anyway, again, thank you all, and uh, we will stay in touch and um, see y'all tomorrow. I'm going to say, I'll you on in prayer. Okay. Um, I'll stay around for a few minutes in case somebody wants to come and talk to me personally. Because sometimes people don't want to open up the same thing where everybody wants to hear it. And like, that's okay. That's positive. So let us go to the morning prayer. Dear Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity, Father. The opportunity to come and bless your children, Father, to just teach them and train them and give them a little bit of knowledge about mental illness, Lord. Father God, I ask right now that you touch every person who took out time to come to this conference today for a seminar, Lord. Touch them and give them everything that they need, Lord. 
Um, just bless them from the top of their head to the bottom of their soul, Father. Lord, if they're dealing with any type of emotional crisis, whether it be for them or for their family, Lord, speak a word to them on what they need to do for them in order to take care of themselves, Lord. We know that we are not evil. We are big in you, Father. We know that we can get the help that you need. And then, Father, if there's someone out there that was like me that can't even get a prayer through, they need to know that you're sitting at the right hand of the Father and you're making intercession for them so that they don't have to give up hope because you know exactly what they need and when they need it, Father. Lord, I thank you for just being you, Father. I thank you for creating a clean heart in us, Father, renewing the right spirit in us, Father, because sometimes we have the wrong spirit. We need to get back to the fact so we can have the right spirit within us, Father. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. May everyone go out and be blessed and be a blessing to someone else. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.